do better than that. How's everybody doing? There we go. Y'all get ready to sing. We praise you. Come on, put your hands together.
they mourn the Savior. Come on. But it wasn't for long. Why? Oh, he left. He's risen from the grave. Victorious, our Savior reigns. Oh, yes, he reigns. He rose. Christ again. I want you to make it personal. I know all the words up there don't make it where it's singing about and Jesus Christ crucified through his death there is life by the blood of the Lamb I have been born. Sing my debt. My debt has been paid. There is grace of Amen. Give somebody a high five and you may be seated. Woo, that's awesome. I would say that you can give a person on the other side of you. Oh, Joy hitting both sides there. She ain't even joking this morning. 
I'm so glad that y'all are here today. You picked a good day to come. In the 1030 service during this part, we'll actually be doing some baptism. But y'all are going to get a longer message today. I'm just kidding. I'm not preaching any longer. So, Some people say, you need to preach longer. And I'm like, hey, listen, I only got so much in me. But I can tell you this, today, this series that we're starting on Ruth is going to be life-changing for some people in this room. I can promise you that. I promise you that. I want to take just a second, I want to welcome you out to Crossover. I know that we've got some people that maybe you haven't been here in a while, but you're here today for the first time. Coming, And we got some old-timers here. And for our old-timers here, I want to encourage you, don't just get settled in and just say, hey, two songs and a tithe and then two songs and a message and then go home. Let's pray that God makes this brand new to us today. So let's make it like it's our first time here at church and at the same time, last time that we'll ever have a chance to raise our hand and lift our voices to worship our king let's make it count let's make today count so welcome out uh i do want to say this on the outside there uh we've got that that room that's called the gratitude room i don't even think i got a slide for that but if you haven't signed our gratitude room wall out there i know yesterday he said man i'm just out here reading some of these things and it's just awesome, man, to see where people are thankful for things. So if you've got something that you're grateful for, kind of like you're going to go, hey, uh, put your name and input. I've got the world's greatest pastor. Hey, that's cool with me. We can do that. So, uh, Or if you want to put, we've got the world bouncer with Danny Pilgrim back there. Do that. So world's greatest band, you know, whatever. So uh, whatever you want to do for the, for the gratitude room. Uh, but also... Uh, while you're here, if you take out your cell phones, make sure they're on silent. But if you haven't signed up for our, our devotions, I know that I have a devotion. You just text at CCDevo2 to 81010. And it's almost the same thing for Jessica's. For I, I would say our youth devotion, but it's really Jessica's. So if you want a female take, just text at 09CCTeens to 81010. Her devotions this week have been So if you're not getting those... Uh, make sure that you kind of sign up for those things today. Uh, do I have an, any more announcements? Am I forgetting some? I do want to challenge you. I don't have the sheets up here, but we still have some blanks that need to be filled in for child care for our, our 1030 service. And uh, I'm just going to be honest with you. Our 9 o'clock service, y'all are awesome, awesome at serving. But our 1030 not so much. So I love y'all more. Don't tell them that. But I love y'all more. <laughs> So thank y'all for signing up to serve, but if you want to pick up an extra day, we'll have some sign-up sheets for you to get that, and uh, let's just get ready to give. Man, I'm ready to get into this more announcements, but I'm saying bump all those. Uh, we have baskets up here. I do want to thank you for giving. I want to thank you so much uh, for being faithful and giving every week. Because of you, we're able to do events. Speaking of events... I think that we've got Mother's Day and Father's Day that's going to be coming up, Memorial Day, but our next big event is, right? How many of y'all would like to uh, help me, and don't, listen, think about this, you would like to help me plan that July the 4th event, it's really the biggest outreach event that we have, just raise your hand up, uh, Devin, Derek, okay, I see that, are you making a mental picture of all good, yeah, I'm going to tell you, Deborah does parking, and holy cow, Deborah comes out. Deb is cool, but you don't want to you don't want to get out of line because when you see Deborah, it's bad. So, I, I'm just kidding. She did such a good job of of running the parking last year. Uh, so if you want, I know that in a couple of weeks we will actually have a meeting where we start putting the pieces together. Uh, this year we're going to raise the money. We're going to raise the money to put that on. I literally had a guy that stopped by here the other day. He was dropping off a, uh, what is that, Uber Eats or DoorDash. And him and up and they said, hey, we came to y'all's July the 4th. They don't even go to church here. We came to y'all's July the 4th thing, and it's the best one that we've ever seen. And I was like, man, I appreciate that. You know, kind of like pat on the back. Thank you for... Uh, for for that compliment, he goes, no, I'm I'm serious. He goes, I've been to a bunch of July the Fourths, and he goes, we so let's make this one the biggest and the baddest and the most awesome one that we've ever had. And uh, you know, I went yesterday to another church, and they were doing a nine year celebration for their celebrate recovery, and it was awesome. But any time that a pastor goes to another church, we're comparing, you know, comparing. I got home last night, and I, you know what? Our church knows how to throw a party. 
Like we we know how to throw a party, and it's awesome. And I love I love the fact they're going to these other churches. But it's so cool to be able to come in here and y'all show up and show out. I don't even know what he said. I have these things in my ears, so he probably said Dwayne's hot, and that's fine. As a matter of fact, let's get our children's pastor up here to say the prayer over the tides. When he says amen, y'all are going to stand up and take out your cell phones, and you're going to take some selfies, and you're going to hashtag them, Crossover Church, GA, Crossover Church, GA, and put them on your social media. everybody. Thank you all for coming out. Um, let's bow our heads and pray. <clears throat> Father God, we come to you this morning and we thank you for each and every person in this room, Father. We thank you for all the blessings in our lives, the ones we fail to realize, Father. We pray that, that as people give this morning, Father, that you would stretch these ties to go as far as we could possibly take them, Father, that, that they would be used to glorify your name, Father, and that each person in here would be blessed, Father, in, in order to just give as much as they could possibly give. Pray that as Dwayne brings this message, Father, that him from the situation and you would just shine a light through him into this room, Father, that, that all ears would be open and all hearts would be receptive, Father. And it's in your name we pray this morning. Amen. Y'all get up, take some selfies, and make it weird, because why not? Because we're at crossover. <laughs> so just make it weird.
God, we just want to come to you and tell you how much we love you. Seriously, I am crazy in love with you. Thank you for worship. Pray now as we move into your word, God, that you would just continue to move in our hearts, open our minds to be receptive. And God, help us to, to reach out and just to touch heaven today with this. And God, change lives, change hearts, change people in this room. In Jesus' name, be seated. that even when the voice of God is silent, His providence is reflected in every moment of our lives. Ruth's life was filled with tragedy, death, and loss. But she remained loyal, patient, and obedient, and the Lord restored everything she had lost. Redeemed, renewed, restored. This is the story of Ruth. Read Ruth. Don't lie to me. If you lie in church, you're going to hell. How many of y'all read Ruth chapter one this week? A couple of you? No, no. What the heck? Lord, I pray that you would forgive all these sinners that I'm fixing to <laughs> preach to. Go to hell when they die. Amen. Amen. Listen, I'm really excited about this book of Ruth. If y'all remember the last time that I preached, which by the way, Jessica did an amazing job last week, man. So uh, they're not here today. Matter of fact, um, First Baptist Church of Helen bought all of Levi's house, bought them 15 new mattresses. Uh, so they felt that it would be appropriate to actually go to First Baptist and, and go in there and say thank you. And I was like, that's a good idea. So our boys aren't here today, and I sure do miss them. Uh, but And I'm sure, listen, I miss their energy. They're crazy. They're crazy. So, But I do love them, but I thought that that was a good thing. So uh, Jessica did a great job, so she's not here. I was like, why was I telling them that? I'm telling you that because Jessica is with them. So next week, I want you to go up to her and seriously make her feel good and tell her that she did a good job. And if you don't think she did a good job, lie to her. Lie to her and tell her, listen, it's a Christian lie, and Christian lies are not that bad. So if you time that I preached a couple of weeks ago, I started out on Easter, and I said, what's your favorite movie? And we talked about Rocky IV, talked about Field of Dreams. Dan, I think you sent me a thing going, uh, somebody sent me a, a picture going, I'm watching, it was Tony Costabile. He's like, I'm watching Field of Dreams and took a picture of it. If you haven't watched it, it's the greatest movie. I digress. Too many cups of coffee today. But let's listen to this. So I'm not going to ask you what your favorite movie is. What's your favorite genre of movie? In other words, the favorite type. So when I say the type, I'm going to show it on the screen. If that's your favorite type, I want to make sure that you're awake, all right? So you be awake. You give me a woo or something, all right, so that I know you're awake. All right, so number one, action movies is your favorite. That was, y'all are not action people. That was so horrible. Watch this. How many of y'all love NASCAR? So, see what I'm saying? So I'm just saying, I love action movies. If that's your favorite genre of, mo of movies, matter of fact, when me and Jenny first got married, we watched every single Bruce Willis movie. Every sick of Bruce Willis. I was like, oh my gosh, which by the way, I know this is action, but this is really the best Christmas movie ever invented is Die Hard. So I'm just saying that. So if you're with me, all right, the next one, comedies. How many are like, I love to laugh. I need a little bit of comedy in my life. Any comedy fans? Okay. Yeah. A little Jim Carrey. Adam Sandler, a little Will Ferrell, the cowbell. You know, we remember those things. How about superheroes? Any Marvel? Uh, no, not so much superhero. You, you think that you got it? Yeah, so you like superhero? Okay, good. A little Batman, a little Spider-Man, a little Superman. Uh, what am I missing? What am I? Uh, thrillers. How about th dead people? The reason why there's not many thriller people in here is because y'all need a little thrill in your life. Being a Christian is not boring. A Quiet Place, Inception, a thriller. Uh, what what am I forgetting? I've got action. I've got comedy, superhero, thriller. What is it? Rom-com. Rom a little sleepless in Seattle. Hey, listen, I will tell you this. For every single one of these I watch at my house, I get to watch three action movies. That's the way that it is. 
Now, I say that because setting it up for the book of Ruth, in the book of Ruth, you're not going to find any Sylvester Stallone, no Liam Neeson. And it's all Sandra Bullock. It's all Julia Roberts. It's a total chick flick whenever we come into this book. The reason why there's no shootouts, there's no explosions, there's no car chases. You might think that it's going to be boring, but I promise it's not going to be boring. It's going to be life changing. Matter of fact, in the book of Ruth, we find that it's actually about a couple of women and there is a heck of a lot of talking. Matter of fact, in the book of Ruth, there's 85 verses and out of 85 verses, 55 of them are dialogue. That's why I call this a chick flick. But in this, it's an amazing, powerful story. We're going to see through this we're going to see tragedy unfold. We're going to see two women that lost everything, but in the middle of losing everything, we're going to see where God was extremely present in the middle of them losing everything. Ruth is one of only two books in the Bible where you don't see any kind of grandeur uh, miracles of God. There's no parting of the Red Sea raising of the dead. There's no healing of the sick. Like this is one of those books that you read it and you can really apply it to your life. And even though you don't see all these crazy miracles in every single verse, you will see the presence, the power and the providence of an almighty God. And I can promise you this book is a life so if you're here today and you're hurting, if you're discouraged, if you feel like God's through with you, if you feel all alone and you feel in despair, I can promise you over the next several weeks that you're going to be blessed as we go through and we talk not just about the book of Ruth, but we talk about Ruth and how her life changed the entire world. It's a really amazing book. So today I'm going to title this message, It's Time to Leave Moab. Everybody say, It's Time to Leave Moab. Maybe you're like, I don't even know what Moab is. Is that like Oakwood? Is that Lula? Like, we're going to discuss that and we'll talk about it. But let's jump in over the next, uh, over these next few verses. Let's when judges ruled in Israel. I highlighted that point because at this point in the Bible, it's all ruled by judges. There are no kings. There's no kings. Matter of fact, what is the book? None of the band answered this. But what is the book right before the book of Ruth in the Bible? Judges, they're good. Some matter of fact, you see this as in the days when uh, when judges ruled in Israel. So there's no kings. The last verse in the book of Judges said, "In those days, Israel had no kings, and the people did whatever was right in their own eyes." So in this day, there was no kings. In this days, everybody kind of ruled themselves. They kind of did what was right in their own eyes. And we're going to kind of talk through that. But it says a severe famine came up up upon this land. And because of this famine, we're going to see, we're about to see a family that they're afraid. They're afraid that they're not going to be able to eat. So because they're afraid they're not going to be able to eat, they pick up and they move everything from to the land of Moab. It says, so a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home he went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with him. Verse number two says, the man's name was Elimelech. Everybody say Elimelech. Elimelech. Look at the person beside you and say Elimelech. Elimelech. That's just a fun name to say. Some of you hate shame on you. You should definitely do it. Because in your head right now, you're going Elimelech, Elimelech. All right, so... You should have just said it out loud and got it out. All right, so it says his wife, his wife was Naomi. Naomi, how you doing? So their two sons were Mal uh, Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem. And, the and they reached Moab, and they settled there. So we're seeing right off the bat that there's a family that's from Bethlehem, and they went from Bethlehem to a place called Moab, and they lived there. But before we go any further, I want to break down the characters that we're going to be talking about, all right? So first of all, we see Elimelech. Elimelech is the dad. His name actually means, my God is king. So anytime that somebody said Elimelech, what they were saying was out loud. They were saying, my God is king. Well, then we've got his wife, Naomi. Naomi's name means sweet or pleasant. How many of y'all could call your wife Naomi? I've got my hand raised. Tim, you got There's a couple of us in here. You better raise your hand, dude. I, you, he's looking at her. He was like, he goes, Dwayne, it wasn't I wasn't going to raise my hand. I had to ask her permission. To, so, right, so, so you see that you see my God is king and then you see sweet or pleasant. Now, before I get to the kids' names, I just want to tell you that during this time, 
generation during this, this time of living, when you had a kid, you would either name them based on two things. Either first, you would name them based on like what you wanted to see in their life, like strong. I want them to be strong, so I'm going to call my kid strong. Or maybe powerful. I wanna, I'm going to call them, I'm going to name my kid power because that's what I want to see. But the other way was based on what you saw when they were born. Like me, I would have been son of one hand. You know, like that would have probably been my name. One handed man or, you know, sexy beast. I don't know. I'm just saying, but we're going to find out. Look, to Malon, his name was sick or sickly. So I think that they probably, he was born and he, I don't know, looked like Deb and he was sick or sickly. So sick. But then you got Killian, frail or tired. So you've got my God is king, sweet or pleasant. And they had kids sick and tired. So it's just so crazy. So my God is king, Elimelech. He's worried about his family because there's a famine. And he's afraid that everybody's going to die in his family. So he picks Bethlehem and he goes to Moab. I wanted to show you a map of what that looks like. So Bethlehem over to Moab, Bethlehem over to Moab. That, that was about a 50 mile journey. So by foot, most of us walk three to four miles an hour. So it would have took about 16 to 17 hours to walk this journey or split it into two days. You could do that or whatever. But Elimelech takes his family from Bethlehem. He takes them to the land of Moab and it ends up being a crazy, awful, horrible mistake. Now, the reason I want you to think about this is because God had forbidden his people. Now, Elimelech and Naomi and Malon and Kilo people and God had forbid his people from leaving Bethlehem and going to the place of Moab. God had said, you stay in Bethlehem. Don't go to Moab. Remember a few, let me go back. A few weeks ago, you see the Jordan River right there in the middle. Remember we said that's the type of Christ, right? So they had, the children of Israel had actually went over here from the east over the Jordan. They had passed through, we'll say, passed through Jesus. And for them to get from Bethlehem back to Moab, what do they got to do? They got to pass back the wrong way. So that's just something free for you. But with that being said, God had forbid his people from going to Moab. Maybe you're going, well, why? why? What's so bad about Moab? Well, the Moabites were descended by the name Moab. So Moab is the one that started the whole Moabite nation. And you go, well, Dwayne, what's the big deal about that? Well, the reason that Moab was actually born was because Lot in the Old Testament had got drunk and fell asleep and his daughters came in and had sex with him. And then they had a kid and their kid's name Moab. Moab. So we find out the Moabites were actually conceived out of incest. And they, were, they also worshipped a false god named Kamash. And Kamash was a god that they would worship. These Moabites would actually sacrifice their kids to this false god of Kamash. So because God had said, don't go to Moab, stay Moab. And it's not the mother of all bombs. It's just a bad place because they were conceived out of incest. They worship false gods there. It's a place of idolatry. Whatever you do, stay away from Moab. Matter of fact, you go, well, what does God really think about Moab? In Psalms chapter 90, this is what he says. Uh, he says, I don't know where I'm at. There we go. Uh, he says, there we go. Moab is my wash basin. God was actually telling them, saying, hey, this Moab is a place where I would wash my dirty feet. Moab is not a good place. It's a bad place. So Moab is a place that God doesn't want them to go. If you remember, Beth called the house of bread. Jesus is the bread of life, right? So Bethlehem is the house of bread, and Moab is this place that God had forbid them to go, but they left, and they went from Bethlehem over to Moab. I'm going to say that over and over and over today in this message. So we find out that Elimelech, my God is king, he wasn't living like God was his king. He really wasn't. He was doing what was right in his own eyes, which so many people do the same thing today. We do what's right in our own eyes. And I want to cut, listen, I want to cut Elimelech a little slack because there was a famine in the land. And he was thinking, if I go to Moab, maybe it'll be a better economy. If I go to Moab, I've heard stories about over there in the grass over in Moab. And I think if I go to Moab, my family won't die. I think that things are going to be really good if I can just pick up and go from here and over to here. I'll get a better job. I'll be more stable. I can feed my family. I'll have a better house. But I just want to issue a spiritual warning to everybody in this place because I see it all the time to our families, a lot of times we're tempted to prioritize economic provision over spiritual protection. Like sometimes in our life, we'll get a job offer somewhere and that job offer is offering us more money. So we're thinking, hey, I'm over here and I see more money over here. This must be where God wants me to go. 
it is. Danny, sometimes God wants you to pick up and leave where you're at and go over here so he can bless you more. But sometimes and oftentimes it's not. We've got to sit down and we got to pray about it. I've seen so many people in their life that they're over here and they're doing what's right and they're plugged into church and they're, they've got godly friends and then they're bit more money at a job over here so they pick up and they leave and because they go over here for more money they don't get to go to church as much or they miss in church because of this or that and the other and you know what I see whenever you get away from God maybe you got a little bit more money but you got a lot less God Amen. I'm never prioritize economics over the presence of God you got to be very careful so Elimelech picks up his family and he moves to Moab the sinful land of Moab because times got tough in Bethlehem. Times got real tough in Bethlehem. You know what I found out? I found out that sometimes when times get tough, I ask myself the question, do I continue to trust God or do I go to Moab? What do you do when times get tough? Like if I were to sit down and it's easy for us to come into church and go, well, I'm here on a Sunday. But seriously, when times get tough in your life, what do you do? Do you leave and you go to Moab or do you stay in Bethlehem? Because people will go, Dwayne, I'm a Christian. I God is the king of my life, just like Elimelech. I trust his word, but then you're dating somebody, and God's word says don't have sex until you're married, and you go, I'm going to trust God, I'm going to trust God, but I've been dating and waiting, and I've got a deep desire for mating. <laughs> I've got need. <laughs> do you trust God, or do you go to Moab? Do you trust God and stay in Bethlehem or do you go to Moab? Hey, when it comes to our finances, God says that 10% is his. Do we trust him and say, God, I trust you with my money. I trust you with every single bit of it. But then times get tough and you're not making that over. And, and you're going, God, I just don't know that I can really give to you. And that thing's on sale and it looks really good. You know what I found out? There's people in this church that you're driving your tithe. You're on the lake on your tithe. You're fishing with your tithe. You're hunting with your tithe. You got tithe on your wall in your house because you took what was God's and you helped yourself. So when the times get tough, do you trust God or do you, oh, do you move to Moab? I'm going to stop getting drunk. I'm not going to get drunk anymore. God says that don't be a drunkard. I'm not going to be a drunk anymore. So you stop. You have a really stressful day at work. Or you you go home and your wife has brought you a cat. I don't know. I don't. That would make me be like drunk. Whatever. Give me the thirty eight. Anyway, so I'm just saying, when times get tough in your life, do you stay where God wants you, or do you go to do you go to Moab? That's what I found out. When times get tough, Moab looks tempting, doesn't it? Moab looks tempting, so I'm not judging Elimelech. I said all that to just say I understand his dilemma. He's worried about his family. He doesn't want them all to starve. He doesn't want them to die. So he does what feels right in his own eyes. And most of us have gone to Moab under far less. Yes. Most of us in this room have. So what happened? They left Bethlehem. They left God's people, which I often say your first move away from God is away from the people of God. They left God's people. They left God's will, and they went to Moab. And guess what? Everything worked out fine. Everything perfect just like what they thought they followed their heart they did what was right in their own eyes and everything worked out just like they thought let's go to verse number two three then Elimelech died and Naomi was left with her two sons we're three three verses in Elimelech takes his family from Bethlehem and three verses in Elimelech dies and it says right here her two sons married not women that worship the God of Israel, but they married Moabite women. One married, uh, uh, one married a woman named Orpah, the other uh, a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, it says both sick and tired died died and they left Naomi in Bethlehem. Listen, they left, they left Naomi who left Bethlehem. Why did she leave Bethlehem? So they would live. But now they're all dead. And now she's without her two sons right here and her husband. So we see right at the beginning of the story, heartbreak. Man, it is crazy. It's heartbreak. We see that Elimelech, how he died, heart attack, stroke, ran over by a camel. We don't know. All that we know is he picked his family up from where God said for them to be, and he went over here, and now we read in the third verse that he's dead. And then we find out that this left Naomi. Man, this left her in a very bad place. And I want to say this. It left her in a bad place, but if you're 
told you that Bethlehem to Moab was about 50 miles. So it's only a day or a day and a half journey if you stop at Waffle House or something. I don't know, stay at the Holiday Inn overnight. So about a two days walk, she could have gotten back to where God wanted her to get back to. She could have returned from Moab over to Bethlehem, but she left in a bad place. God's people, and because of that, her sons married women that were not God's people. Uh, they married Moabite women. And I want to give the boys the benefit of the doubt, too, because these chicks were probably hot. <laughs> right? They were probably cute. Maybe, maybe uh, Malon and Kilion was like, we can convert them. You go, that's crazy. We do it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Some people in this room right now, you're missionary dating. <laughs> I'll convert them. I'll convert them, Dwayne. You just watch and see. They're really cute, and they got a good personality, and this one's got a job. The last one didn't even have a job. This one's got a job. Can I tell you that God loves us listening because God actually sets up loving boundaries for us, very loving boundaries. And people will say, Dwayne, I'm a Christian. I am a Christian. Is it okay for me to date somebody that is not a Christian? I'm a Christian. Is it okay for me to date and marry somebody that is not a Christian? And I would simply tell you, absolutely not. It is not okay for you to date or to marry somebody that is not a Christian if you call yourself a Christian. And Scripture says, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Paul is telling us there that God's told him to put this in his word. He's saying to the church of Corinth, don't be unequally yoked. If God is really the king of your life, then why would you want to spend your life raising your kids with somebody who they don't see as their king? Amen. I mean, what's going to happen? The thing that I had wrote down and I was thinking about this, I was like, man, you may marry somebody that is, is gorgeous and is happy and, and handsome, but what if your kid gets sick? Your spouse can't even pray for them. What are they going to do? Rub their cuteness off on them? Why would you want to be with somebody that doesn't hold the values that you hold? So why did they leave Bethlehem? They left Bethlehem so they would But that leads me to something else. What happened when they did what was right in their own eyes? Three of them died. Three of them died anyway. So we find out this is how the chick flick begins. They go from Bethlehem to Moab. Within the first five verses, the three men are dead. And that leaves Naomi. And Orpah with no home, no income, no hope. So what does Naomi do? We're going to find out that she decides to return to Bethlehem. You can read about it in the text. I, I put the verses up here. I'm not even going to spend time reading it because it's a conversation, all right? That's all it is between women and basically Naomi looks at Ruth and Orpah and she says hey listen I'm going back over here I'm leaving Moab I'm going to go back over here to Bethlehem hey Orpah Ruth y'all stay in Moab and marry somebody else I have no more sons for you marry somebody else stay over there have some kids and Orpah that's a good idea so she goes back to Moab and starts a TV show it's a big hit thank y'all thank you Appreciate it. So it was too big of a dad joke to, to miss. Anyway, so she starts, she doesn't really start a TV show. I don't know. But she stays here. But Ruth, we find out that Ruth, for the very first time in the book, she speaks in, in verse. And this is the wedding cake verse. This is the one that we see in all the weddings. Matter of fact, I did a wedding this week and I used this verse. It said, but Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and to turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. And where you live, I will live. At that point, she declares her fierce loyalty to her mother-in-law but then the most important part of the verse declaration of her dependence on God your people will be my people Ruth your God will be my God I will no longer worship Chemosh I'm leaving Moab and I'm going to Bethlehem with you I worship the God of Israel now see in my mind this is kind of symbolic the point of her salvation where she's She's, she's turning her back on Moab and going to Bethlehem. Matter of fact, anytime you and I, if we're going to leave Moab and go to Bethlehem, we have to turn our back on Moab to be able to go forward to Bethlehem. We can't, we can't hem haw it. We can't straddle the fence. You and I have to make a decision. We're going to leave Moab and go to Bethlehem. And in order to go to Bethlehem, you have to turn your back on Moab. So to go where God wants you to go, you got to leave where you are. To get to the right place, you got to leave the wrong one. Oh, that's right. To get where God wants you to be, you have to leave the wrong 
place that's not as well. If you're dating somebody that's not honoring God and honoring you, in order to marry the right person, you've got to leave the wrong person. Amen. To get to the right place, you got to get you got to leave the wrong one. So we're going to find out. This is amazing. Ruth made her decision to turn her back on that she knew the place that she grew up, the place that she had been married at one point. She decided to turn her back on the false god of Chemosh and turn and follow Naomi, her mean mother-in-law, to follow her and to start serving the God of Israel. At this point, we see one decision, one act of repentance, one changes Ruth's life. Matter of fact, it's so good, it changed the course of the entire world. It changed the course of the entire world. One single decision, one, one moment in her life. Because you say, Dwayne, what's the point? Jesus was the descendant of a sinful Moabite. That's how Jesus was brought into this earth was because Ruth actually had a time where she left Moab and went to Bethlehem following Ruth. We're going to find out in the next couple of weeks that one decision, one act of repentance, one choice changed the world. Have you ever heard of Bethlehem? The house of bread. Remember I said Jesus is the bread of life. That's where he was born, was in Bethlehem. If Ruth would have stayed in Moab, the sinful place of Moab, she would have never got to be in Bethlehem where her descendants would have been in Bethlehem. And through her lineage, through her bloodline, we get the Savior of the world. What does this mean for you? Because I try to break it down every single message. I'm like, here's my, my application. And what does it mean for you? I wonder if there's a, a part of your life that's still in Moab. We started following God. You got in here. You got in church. You accepted Christ. You got is there a part of your life that is still in the place of Moab? Or do you still need to get that one moment of repentance for one single decision that's going to change the trajectory of your life? I mean, there's some of you that you're saying, Dwayne, my God is my king, and yet we're doing what's right in our own eyes. We do what's right in our own eyes. Whether or whether it comes to how we serve, we do what's right in our own eyes. Dwayne, I'm a follower of Jesus. I really am. But you're following your own truth instead of following his truth. So this is the question I want to leave you with. What one decision could you make today? That one action that you could take that would change the trajectory in your legacy. What one decision could you make? What one action could you take to leave Moab and to return, return to Bethlehem? For some of you, it's my job as your pastor to help you. For some of you, you could cut up your credit cards. I don't know why you've got so many. You don't need them anyway. Living your life in debt. Maybe you cut your credit cards up and then you start to, to tithe and you can become more generous. Maybe, maybe you need to be the, the first person to apologize and apologize to somebody for your part and what they did. Maybe some of you in here, the decision you need to make is to break up and to move out or to block that person from your phone or to confess or to, to, to live on a lot less and give a lot more. What one decision could you make? What one action could you take? What is the thing that you need to surrender to God? What is the someone you need to give to God? You got to fall on your knees in broken repentance, man, and surrender. Right place, you got to leave the wrong one. You got to be able to leave Moab. You know what? That I was thinking whenever you leave Moab and you return to Bethlehem. I'm leaving Moab and I'm returning. That re, that word re, it actually means repent. It comes, and it's this the word is mentioned over 1,100 times in the Bible. It's a shoe. Shoe. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I'm saying it with authority, so you think it's right. Shoe. <laughs> Have no idea. Shoe. Shove. Shove. I don't know. Shoe. 1,100 times it's mentioned in the Bible. And I heard this one time and I was thinking, re, to return, to return. And I thought, man, if I could just take and I could make a, a one sentence, a run on sentence sermon about re, because I want to tell you it's all about the re. Look at somebody say it's all about the re. It's all about the re. We got to return. If I could make one sentence that would maybe help you, this is what I would say. When you rebuke the enemy and return to God by repenting of your sins and receiving Christ, your spirit will be reborn, your mind renewed, your life rebuilt, you will be reconciled to Christ, redeeming work. While rejoicing, you will reap the rewards of relationship, causing 
to break free in your life. I want to tell you, in our church, we're not praying for revival. We can be living in revival. We can live in revival every single day. It doesn't have to be six months from now, something we plan. What's stopping us from returning to God today and having a revival? Just up. Man, I'm having revival in my life. I'm closer to God than I've ever been. And I love being with Jesus. And the reason why is because I made, I took one moment and made a decision. I made a choice. And you got to get to the same way. And that can change the trajectory of your life. Are you smoking what I'm selling? I want you to understand. Understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. What is one decision? It could be clean up your language because you don't want your kid dropping the F-bomb in front of their classmates. I don't understand why that's so hard for us to clean up. Wayne, it's just the way that I was raised. It's just the way that I was raised. Well, you were also raised and born lost as a golf ball in high weeds. Are you going to go to hell because that's the way you were raised? Or are you going to make that decision, that moment, that change? Father, we pray that right now in your name, in Jesus' name, the sinless one who gave his life for us. Give us the grace, God. Give us the conviction to take away that one thing, that, that brokenness and sinfulness. You know, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed today, there's some people here that you know what you need to do. It's obvious. I mean, it is so obvious. To you. you should have done it a year ago. And others of you, you're going to have to ask, God, show me what it is. What is the one decision, that one action that I could take that would change the course and the direction and the legacy of my life? The biggest fear that I have is leaving uh, a legacy of death in my family. I don't want my great-grandkids to think, well, my great-grandpa, you know, he, uh, he was an alcoholic. I want my great-grandkids to, to know who I was and to say, man, my great-grandpa was a, a man of God that loved Jesus. What one decision can you make today that will change the of your life? If you need to think about it and you're going, Dwayne, hey, I want you to pray that God would show me what's that one thing that I need to change. Will you just raise your hand? Hey, Dwayne, I need you to help me pray. Oh, I see that hand. I see that hand. There you go. There you go. There you go. God, I pray that right now that for the people that have their hands raised and God, even the ones that because none of us are none of us are Jesus in this room and we all have stuff that we need to change including me God I'm the chief I'm like Paul I'm the chief of sinners in this room God show us what one thing that we need to change one decision that we need to make some people in this room you're going to make that decision Bethlehem the house of bread Jesus was born in Bethlehem through the lineage of a Moabite woman who turned her heart to the God of Israel. Did you say, Dwayne, who is Jesus? He is the living God. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is our salvation. He is our comforter. Why? Is because he was the only person to ever live perfect without sin. He shed his blood on the cross. He died for you. He died for me. He was put in a tomb. And three days later, what we just celebrated two weeks ago, man, he got up out of that tomb. We look at it as a holiday, but it really really happened God said so that anyone and that includes you it doesn't matter who you are how matter doesn't matter how dark your life is how stuck you feel in your sin anyone who calls on his name can be saved forever and be forgiven some of you maybe that's the reason why you're here if you're watching online maybe that's the reason you came on this video for this minute right here this moment right here I want you to declare it today, man, that God is my king. I'm stepping away from Moab. I'm going to live for Jesus. Today, I'm going to make him my king. Today, I'm going to make him my Lord. You today, and you've never accepted him, but you know that you need to accept him as your savior, and that's the one decision. I want you to shoot your hand up. Shoot it up right now so that I can see it. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out, but I want to be able to pray for you. Is there anybody in the room? If you're watching online, just put it in the comment, in the chat. No, oh, man, we'll reach out to you. And I just want to tell you, God loves you. He's crazy about you. Yes, I need him to be my Savior. Yes, I need him to be my King. Yes, I need him to be my Lord. God, I thank you for the...
service today. I'm so grateful that we got to come in here and do this. Lord, I pray that you would continue through this week showing us what one thing that we need to change. What action that we need to take to step away from Moab to go back to Bethlehem, to get back in your presence, to give your grace. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I think that God is awesome. I enjoy preaching that message to y'all. Over the next several weeks as we go through this story, I think that God's going to show us some amazing things. I want to be praying that God will show you where we're at in Moab. Because even if we're, man, we have our lives sold out for Jesus, we think, but maybe there's one little part over here that's still in Moab. If I had all my keys up here, I would show you. There was up in church, we always had that illustration where the preacher would get up with the keys and he'd say, these are the keys to every room in my house. And I gave God all the keys, but I kept this one. And God wants us to give him everything. I love the fact that we have an amazing 9 o'clock service. And y'all get up so much. Y'all to be praying for the next service because next 1030, we're going to be doing some baptism. It's going to be awesome. We're going to see God move in, in some people's lives. But I will be praying for y'all this week. I love each and every one of y'all. Um, I can't believe I get to do this. This is the best job in the world. And it's more than a, I don't, it ain't a job to me. It's just I, I love doing it. And I love seeing y'all's faces. Thank y'all for coming next week. It's going to be super awesome and super special. Do not miss next week. Matter of fact, bring somebody with you. Bring somebody with you. Bring somebody with you. Don't just invite them. Bring them with you. Say the Lord's Prayer. And we will uh, go get the baptismal pool ready. Here we go. Whose Father? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Y'all have a wonderful week. We have CR tomorrow night. We've got our hump day service at 7 o'clock.